video was going to be about building a bookcase but that all fell through so I had to think quick so I decided to do a video today on No Name by Wilkie Collins. It was a book I read a couple of months ago and it quickly became a new favourite. There were two things that first put me off picking the book up. First of all it is huge. Compared to The Woman in White it's almost double the size I think, I'm not sure. But that was one of the first things that put me off and also I seem to have developed the impression that Wilkie Collins is quite a wordy writer but I didn't seem to have any problems with that when I picked this up so I think I just invented that. So yeah, Wilkie Collins is probably best known for The Woman in White. No Name isn't as gothic as The Woman in White but it does deal with similar themes such as illegitimacy and the legal treatment of women and the vulnerability that that kind of forced them into in this period. So the premise of this book is that when Nora and Magdalene's father dies without updating his will, all of his fortune ends up going to his miserly uncle who cuts them off from it essentially. So Nora, the oldest daughter, very serious, becomes a governess and Magdalene, the sort of fiery younger sister, decides that she's actually going to try and fight for it with whatever she can do given the circumstances. So this book is absolutely jam-packed with twists and turns as Magdalene tries to find a way of getting justice despite the position that the legal system has put her in. One of the best things about this book was the plotting and the pacing. This book must have been so meticulously planned, especially given that it was first published in serial form in a magazine. How much planning must have gone into it to make sure that everything flowed so well? So at the time, the foreshadowing in No Name was one of the things it was most famous for. This was largely because of the success that The One in White had. Wilkie Collins had kind of developed a reputation for being able to weave all the answers so tightly into the story. He kind of just had to keep that up. With this book, every single step ties in so well with what went before it. Every detail is important, since it all sets everything up for what's coming next. Everything that happened was so shocking, but equally, once you got there, it was like it was the only thing that ever could have happened. But yeah, I was literally in awe about this aspect of this book. Another thing about this book that I really enjoyed was Magdalene's character development. I thought that it was so beautifully done, not only because she went through a big change and you could see from point A to point B, but because it was only because of who she was at the start that she could get to the point that she was at. It's not like she becomes a totally new person, but it's thinking about and reflecting and literally developing the person she was before, not just changing her, which really stood out to me while I read it. It was only because of how immature and brute-headed she was at the start that she was able to push through and become what she was at the end. In Magdalene's character, it was also one of the few times that as part of that development, I've seen a character have to actually rest and recover properly from what they've been pushing themselves through. And just a side note, mental health in this book does get a little bit tough to read in places, so I would just warn anyone about that. It, it might be worth taking a few seconds to make a cup of tea when you get to that moment, just to prepare yourself for it. <laughs> so like I said, what originates is immature boldness, what comes to her by nature, almost ends up being a face that she has to put on by the end because she just does not have that power anymore. And as you go through the novel, you see her gradually realise that that power, that determinedness isn't necessarily enough to get her through. It's absolutely heart-wrenching as you're reading this book to see the things that she puts herself through, forces herself to do, and at points she is literally dragging herself to try and do these things which she thinks will get her her justice. And it's so sad to think that the original readers thought that all of these things that she was doing made her an irredeemable character, as though tricking someone into marriage is the worst thing that anyone's ever done in a book. And when I finished the story, uh, when I thought about the happy ending, the fortune restored, I felt a bit weird about how it didn't feel like it was anything that Magdalene had done that ended up restoring their fortune. It all ended up being through Nora, who was perfectly appropriate for her class. She did everything right, she took the slow road and, and ended up being able to bring them out of it. And when I finished the book, it took me a while to realise that that wasn't actually what had happened. And I was quite relieved to work that out because I thought that after everything that Magdalene has been through, for that to not be what helps them, 
was really disheartening and it was almost as though that kind of en ending was to punish Magdalene for everything that she'd done. But I think I should have paid better attention. <laughs> Turns out she wasn't punished at all and that is what got the first readers so upset about this book. <laughs> but I won't go into too much detail about how and why the fortunes are restored because I think that's the whole point of reading the book. Uh, so I'll leave that to you. <laughs> so one of the things that I didn't like as much when I first finished reading it but then as I gradually reflected on it I kind of came round to the idea as I thought about it more and more and that is the love interest in this book. So Magdalene in this book has three love interests I think. One is Frank, he's like foliage in the woods if you get that reference, you know, he's, he's a bit meh. Uh, and then there is the person that she tricks into marrying her, and then there is Captain Kirk towards the end. Now, it's Captain Kirk that I kind of had a bone to pick with, because his whole character felt like it was just there to be the love interest, and nothing more. And I was kind of a bit disappointed in that. I kind of felt that like with all the meticulousness of this book that was chucked in you know it just doesn't match the mood so he's brought in about I don't know maybe halfway through the book as this guy on the street that just kind of notices her and then goes off to China <laughs> and then at the end of the book he returns nurses her back to health helps her and becomes the main love interest how very convenient I thought and like by the end I was actually thinking you know what it is kind of nice that he, she has someone to take care of her like she's been forced through all this she's got no support it is so nice that she has someone. Definitely like want the best for Magdalene dear. But you know that was all the positive thought I could give it really. But then I was reflecting on how meticulous this book was and whether it actually was as one dimensional as I thought it was. So one of the things is just that like you know the Victorians love a good happy ending, what are you gonna do about it? And the other thing is that like many of the foreshadowing bits in this book it turns out that that was kind of what had to happen. I'm not the biggest lover of romance, but my views on this did change as I thought about it more. One of the things that made me change my mind on this was how much the reviewers were saying that she did not deserve this, which pff, that alone was enough to make me want to support her. <laughs> but then in terms of the foreshadowing and everything, I thought about Captain Kirk and how everything he did kind of tied in and made him that perfect match for her. I don't think again that I should go into it too much but it was a lot more satisfying once you started to see that that trail of breadcrumbs was also there. And yeah once I realised this and once I thought about his character and how he treats her he kind of gained back my respect at the end despite the slight creepiness of him watching her over a wall. But yeah like I said I would kind of warn you if you're sensitive to things about suicidal thoughts because it does go in quite a bit into where it takes her mentally uh, and she does buy some poison and stuff like that and think about it quite soberly. But yes, just remember that true to Victorian form there was a happy ending so keep that in mind. But one of the main reasons that Wilkie Collins wrote this book was to almost raise awareness of what the legal system was doing to these women. Um, having Magdalene compared with Nora, Nora who does exactly what's kind of expected of her in her situation. Oh, you've lost your fortune? become a governess. When times are hard and you're of a certain class you just become a governess. That's just what's done and she did it and played the part to perfection and did get a reward at the end. Um, and then you've got Magdalene who does the opposite of what was expected of her. She fights for it, she uses deception and acting and lying to find her way and she did find her way in the end. She did get what she wanted and what you know what was right but that did also take its toll on her. And I think the point of the book is not necessarily to say, fight for what you believe in, or don't fight for it, it'll come to you. I think neither of those are actually what it's saying. I think it's just saying that like, look, this is what you're forcing these women to have to do. You either have to be really saintly humble, or you have to fall, basically. So yeah, quite broadly speaking, at the time, the law was that if you aren't 100% legitimate, even if you've been treated as such by your family, if you weren't 100% legitimate, you didn't have a legal name, you didn't have a foot to stand on. So that's kind of where the title comes from, is that their surname, Van Stone, they didn't actually have a claim to. And it's heartbreaking because their dad doted on them. He treated them as though they were, you know, legitimate, His, him and his wife's 
children together, they raised them together, the children did not know. And that's the most heartbreaking thing about this book is they were launched into this horrible reality and they had to adapt to it like that. And that split decision, one makes the choice to go one way and one makes the choice to go the other way. Yeah, it's just kind of questioning what the legal system is there for if it's making people have to make a decision about whether to be good or bad. There shouldn't have to be a decision there because with the law, usually it's something that you look at and go, ah, oh, of course the law says this because that's right, but this was something that really wasn't right. So yeah, it's a really... It's an amazing book, I think. I think it really goes into the nooks and crannies of what do we see as right. A lot of the injustices that we just don't see in life, and there are so many of them, and once you start looking into them, you know, they just magnify and get bigger and bigger. The irony and tragedy of the law causing lawlessness is crazy. <laughs> I don't know, I really enjoyed this book and I would really recommend it to anyone, especially, you know, sensation fiction lovers. I really enjoyed it and I don't know what else I can say. I feel like I've not said very much but I also feel like I've rambled quite a lot. But the only other thing is I love the cover. It's almost as though, um, you know, it's like they've been cut out of the picture, which is just perfect. But yeah, an adaptation of this will be great, I think. Great series. But we'll have to see if anyone does that. But yeah, those were my thoughts on No Name by Wilkie Collins. Yeah, I'd love to hear if anyone else has read this because I've not heard very much talk about it. But yeah, hopefully I'll be back with another video soon. And until then, see ya. <laughs>